Uh, this is Scott Rader from Boulder, Colorado, but the executive director of the Alabama Water Institute. And I want to welcome uh, folks to a webinar that we've set up with Dr. Martin Clark. Um, I had the uh, privilege of working with Martin and you, uh, Karn Enkar. Uh, he's now up at the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, I want to thank folks. I know folks are busy, but I thank you for taking time out of your busy day uh, to look at this effort. Um, I want to point out that we try and bring these seminars to you to give you some updates on uh, things that are, are definitely of interest. And I can tell you that what Mark will talk about will be of interest. His official title is he's the Associate Director for the Center for Hydrology and Cold Water Labs up at the University of Saskatchewan. But he did work at NCAR. He has a PhD in Geography from Colorado. And he's co-authored over 150 journal articles since receiving his PhD in 1998. So with that, uh, we'll let Martin present. And then if we can, what we'll do is uh, take questions, answers, and I will hand it over to Martin. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks, thanks a lot, Scott. And you can hear me okay? Yep. Sounds perfect. Okay, perfect. Thanks for inviting me, Scott. It's, um, it's really nice to at least meet with you virtually. Um, looking forward to the time when I can come down in person and you know, see everyone and have some more in-depth conversations. Um, what I wanted to talk about today, <coughs> excuse me, and hopefully I haven't made a rookie mistake and include too much information. So I want to introduce the Global Water Futures Program. I want to talk about some of the work that we've been doing um, in computational hydrology to um, develop probabilistic meteorological forcing data sets for North America, model agnostic workflows, um, developing comprehensive benchmarking systems, um, unifying approaches to hydrological modeling, improving continental domain network routing models, and understanding the predictability of stream flow um, across North America. And then I'll sum up a little bit at the end. So to go, to go through quickly, Global Water Futures is a, is a pretty big program. We, we think, and we're pretty sure that it's the, it's the largest um, um, freshwater research program in the world. Um, it's um, based on a um, 70 odd million um, dollar grant um, from the Canadian government. And then with cost sharing from the different universities involved, um, it's um, probably like 250, um, 300 odd, odd, odd million dollar effort. Um, over, over a multi-year period. So um, John Pomeroy is the director of Global Water Futures, my colleague um, John Pomeroy, he's um, just a couple of doors down from me in the office. Um, the goals here are to place Canada as a global leader in water science for cold regions and address the strategic needs of the Canadian economy to, ad to adapt to change and managing the risks of uncertain water futures and extreme events. Um, so it's a nice program um, to be to be part of. Um, um, the motivations for it are, of course, um, 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 many climate um, dominated and understanding that a lot of the climate impacts are going to be quite pronounced um, in northern regions. This is a graph here of um, de um, declining sea ice extent in the Arctic. Um, some um, shrinking snow seasons. This is a time series of um, Northern Hemisphere spring snow cover over the last few decades and the um, declining snow cover um, over the Northern Hemisphere. Um, this is um, having an impact on recreation. Um, what I'm showing here is, uh, is a figure from the Vobis et al paper published in 2017 um, showing the sites, the ski areas that are opened by Christmas, by the Christmas holiday. Um, so the baseline is um, over 60% um, of sites are open by the um, Christmas holiday, and then we're looking at different climate change scenarios. 4.5 is a um, moderate climate change scenario. RPC 8.5 is a more extreme climate change scenario. Um, and by 2050 and 2090, we're seeing that you know a lot of the ski areas um, across the US are not going to be open by the Christmas holiday. So there's lots that we could show here. I don't want to dwell on this too much, um, but you know, we're seeing um, vulnerabilities in agriculture, water, ecosystems, communities, commerce, forests, recreation, health, energy, infrastructure, et cetera. In Global Water Futures, it's a massive program. I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. Um, one of um, the key things that, um, um, that John Pomeroy has been involved in and the Smart Water Systems Lab has been advances in observation technology. This is an example here. Um, we've put a pretty big LIDAR on a drone, and um, this is um, work that Phil Hart has been doing, and um, that's being used um, to provide maps, really detailed maps of the spatial variability in snow across mountain catchments. Um, 
we build models. This is work from um, Chris Marsh and um, Vincent Viennet, um, where we've got um, advanced next generation modeling systems to model, explicitly model the snow drifting processes and then um, using the advanced um, snow measurements that we're taking to evaluate those models. We're pushing forward over fairly large domains. Um, so a lot of the work that we're doing um, that I'm going to touch on here um, is ensemble forcing to um, provide uncertain estimates of the meteorological inputs to our hydrological models. Um, um, large domain parameter estimation, I'm not going to talk about that um, a lot today. Model benchmarking I'll touch on. I will talk about our efforts to unify approaches and process-based hydrological modeling. And I will talk a little bit about our work um, to um, develop the next generation of network routing models. Often, you know, what we're doing is we're working over large domains and we can make figures like this over um, continental domains, but there's a lot of science behind these figures that we're really struggling to understand. We're really struggling to understand um, um, how we can improve the process representation in our models, um, how we can um, estimate the parameters in our models, and how we can take advantage of um, the revolutions that we have in high performance computing. So as part of the Global Water Futures Program, um, we've got a core modeling effort. Um, so this is led by Al Petronero and I, um, coordinated by Prabin um, Rakoya. Some of you may know Al, he's the Executive Director of the National Hydrological Service in Canada. Um, it's kind of like the top, and well, in some respects, you know, the, the, the top hydrology position in Canada. Um, so Al and I are, are leading that together. Um, we've got a number of themes, um, spatial meteorological forcing data, um, geospatial intelligence, current and next generation hydrological modeling, water quality modeling, water resources modeling, hydroeconomics, hydrological forecasting, etc. you know, with different theme leads associated with that. And the team that we, <coughs> excuse me, the, the team that we have working on here is um, 31 faculty, um, about 33 postdocs and um, 21 collaborators. So I'm not going to talk about all of this here. I'm going to um, talk about our work to advance the computational infrastructure for large domain process-based hydrological modeling. Um, I'm actually located in a small town of, um, of Canmore um, near Calgary. That's where our mountain lab is, the cold water laboratory. Um, so uh, many people say that Canmore is to Calgary um, what Boulder is to Denver. It's um, the, um, a, a small town um, nestled up in the Canadian Rockies. Um, I've built a group here um, and, um, and we're working on um, different aspects of computational hydrology. I wanted to first talk about the work that we're doing um, to build probabilistic meteorological forcing data sets for North America. So some background here, and this is, um, this is a figure um, from Brian Hen's paper in 2016. And what this figure is showing is um, different deterministic um, estimates of precipitation over um, California. And what we're seeing is that we've got different estimates of precipitation. You know, people have used different methods and the differences can be as much as 500 millimeters or um, greater than 25% um, or more, you know, across, across these different data sets. Often what we're doing in hydrological modeling is we say, okay, and we've got this meteorological forcing data set and we're implicitly considering this as truth. We know that there's a lot of uncertainty here and we want to characterize that uncertainty explicitly. So we know, you know, when we're looking in the mountains, um, this is um, uh, just a, a few minutes from my house, um, um, we can see that the uncertainty in precipitation is the dominant source of uncertainty that we have in many environments. So we've been looking at this um, for um, quite a long time. This is a paper that I did um, with Drew Slater um, back in 2006, um, where we said, okay, you know, we're interested in characterizing the uncertainty in spatial meteorological fields um, so that we can understand how our um, uncertainty in the meteorological inputs to hydrological models affect you know, the model state variables and our um, predictions of hydrological processes. So what we did is um, we used um, um, geostatistical methods. We used locally weighted regression um, to provide an estimate of the CDF of precipitation at each grid cell. And then we um, generated spatially correlated random numbers to sample from that CDF 
um, to provide a few ensemble member examples um, that we consider as equally, equally plausible representations of the precipitation that occurred on that particular day. So on the left there is the map of precipitation from the station locations. And on the bottom, the bottom three plots there, uh, what we view is um, three equally plausible representations of the precipitation that occurred in that day. Later on, about 10 years later, um, my postdoc at the time, Andy Newman, um, extended this methodology to the contiguous United States. So here we're showing an example where we've got um, two equally plausible representations of precipitation um, for um, June of 1993. Um, and on the upper right is the ensemble mean, so that's something that we would get from a deterministic data set. Um, but we also have the ensemble standard deviation, and this method is, is nice in many respects because it enables us um, to look at the space-time variability and the uncertainty that we have in the meteorological fields. In this case here, we've got um, the standard deviation is larger in the southern part of the domain where precipitation is more convective in nature and there's shorter correlation length scales. So this data set here was constructed from 1980 to 2012. It's freely available, daily spatial fields of precipitation and temperature, um, 100 ensemble members. We're seeing this move from deterministic data sets um, to probabilistic data sets to be quite widespread um, around the world now. It's um, um, going to be beginning to enter into this new paradigm. Um, this is an example from Europe by Fry and Asota, um, published in JGA Atmospheres in 2019. So their method is you know, quite similar to ours. Um, they had Bayesian inference of parameters in a cricking model, and then they had the same step that we did where they had conditional simulation using Gaussian random fields. What I'm showing in this figure here is example ensemble members um, for a convective case, which is in the left column, and um, for a stratiform case, um, which is in the right column. And um, just in the figures that I showed from our work, um, these are both considered equally plausible representations of um, what happened on those particular days. It's also um, been extended in another study, Corners et al, um, to all of Europe. Um, this was published in JGR Atmospheres in 2018. Um, so the, um, their method is um, also similar to ours, where they use a generalized additive model um, to estimate um, the precipitation fields, and then um, they apply conditional simulation using Gaussian random fields. Um, so here's um, some example ensemble members from the 1st of June 2013, and again, each of these is viewed as equally plausible representations of reality. And they provided an example um, um, of um, probabilistic evaluation. So what they're looking at here is um, both discrimination and reliability. Discrimination is shown on the left and reliability is shown on the right. Um, so discrimination is asking the question, um, to what extent is the probability distribution different um, for events and non-events? And um, the extent to which these probability distributions differ is the extent to which you can provide um, discriminatory power. Um, reliability is saying, well, okay, let's um, bin um, the forecasts, you know, and all the estimate, the probabilistic estimates into different probability bins. So everything, you know, near 0.25, et cetera, and then count, you know, the number of events, you know, that occurred in those bins. And um, for statistically reliable estimates, you want um, things to be on the one-to-one -one line. Um, so this is um, showing results for events of the rainfall rate above um, zero millimeters, above 12.5 millimeters, above 25 millimeters, and above 50 millimeters. We've been um, taking these methods and um, applying them over North America. We're really interested in um, North America as our modeling domain. Um, so our first step was to create a serially complete data set for North America. A lot of the stations that we're using um, have got missing data or gaps in the record, um, and, and we can get much better estimates if we fill those in. Um, so here we had a um, multi-source and multi-strategy um, gap filling um, methodology where um, we combined the um, data from neighboring stations with reanalysis data um, to fill gaps and the, and the station records. And then we did that using um, 16 different um, gap filling strategies, um, including machine learning. Um, so now we've got serially complete data for about 20,000 stations across North America that we've made publicly available and other groups are beginning to use that in their own research. 
Um, for EMDNA, our, our approach extends. You know, what we've done in the, in, in the previous work, our previous work was um, providing probabilistic um, precipitation estimates just based on station data. And um, what we've done is um, combined the reanalysis data, which is necessary because um, a lot of um, the station networks are, are sparse at the higher latitudes, so we need the reanalysis data. So we've got optimal interpolation methodologies that combine um, the station-based probabilistic estimates with the reanalysis data, and then EMDNA, which is the ensemble meteorological data set for North America, um, produces the ensemble um, that we can um, use in our subsequent analyses. So this, as I mentioned, extends our previous based work on station-based estimates. I showed the results from Newman et al. Um, 2015. And we also had um, more recent approaches um, um, for areas outside the contiguous United States. So um, we've got a product for Hawaii in 2019, and then also um, for Alaska, um, which was just published uh, a couple of months ago. So we've um, finished the first version of that data set and we've submitted our paper to Earth System Sciences and Data and um, we've already made the data set publicly available, which is beginning to be used in a lot of different applications. Our probabilistic evaluation of this data is um, here I'm showing the same um, discrimination and reliability assessments that we'd used um, back in the Clark and Slater 2006 paper um, and also subsequently in the um, assessments that were used um, used in Europe. And um, so here we're looking at discrimination um, for um, event thresholds of zero millimeters and 10 millimeters um, on the left and on the right, um, 25 millimeters and 50 millimeters. Um, so the discrimination, the black is showing the discrimination where there's no, the probability distribution where there's no precipitation, the red showing the probability distribution where there is precipitation showing that there's some discriminatory power and our discriminatory power decreases as the event size gets larger, as we'd expect. And when we look at the um, statistical reliability, um, we can see that generally we're close to the one-to-one -one line, so our probabilistic estimates you know, are quite reliable. Um, we're moving forward and um, that's just part of it, um, well the first part of it because we need probabilistic inputs to our models and um, we also need to um, configure our models um, for large geographical domains. So the work that we've been doing has been to develop um, model agnostic workflows. If you look at all the work that's required to configure a process-based hydrological model, um, we can see that there's lots of um, common processing tasks. So no matter what model you're using, you need to delineate the basins, you need to um, process the digital elevation data, process the soil and vegetation data, process the meteorological data, process the river networks, etc. And most of those tasks um, and, and are needed for every model, every process-based model that you apply across large domains. There's just a few tasks at the end um, that are model specific. So um, what we've been doing has been um, trying to carefully separate um, the tasks um, that are model agnostic, how we specify the domain, um, how we process the parameter data, how we process the forcing data, how we process the routing data, et cetera. And then just have a thin layer at the end um, that um, describes the steps that are model specific. And um, so that um, provides all of the information that we need. And then we've got some set up tasks and then um, running our models on high performance computing facilities, um, post-processing, et cetera. Um, what we're um, really doing here and what we're, um, <coughs> what we're moving towards is to improve the um, efficiency of um, continental domain model implementation tasks. So our motivations are to make it easier to collaborate, easier to keep track of work, um, increase the transparency, reproducibility, code reuse, et cetera. So we've got all of these tasks in a GitHub repository that we're beginning to share with other modeling groups to um, accelerate the model implementation tasks. So what this is really getting at is to advance the paradigm of community hydrological modeling rather than a community hydrological model. We recognize that there's lots and lots of models in hydrology and they've got different purposes and getting everybody to converge on a single model um, it seems to be a little bit foolhardy. Um, but what we can do is recognize that most of the work that we do is quite similar and that we can do a much better job of sharing the code and insights across different model development groups. I want to talk a little bit about our comprehensive benchmarking system. 
Um, it's got different elements, um, synthetic test cases, process-based model evaluation, and, uh, and formal benchmarking. Um, so the first thing that we're doing, and, and this is a paper that's under review at the moment, is that we've um, developed what we're calling laugh tests for land models. Um, where uh, uh, these are just um, basic tests of you know what we expect the models to be able to do. So we're calling these um, these laugh tests um, because if a model fails a laugh test, it's really difficult to um, seriously consider the use of the model for its intended applications. And what I'm showing here is one example where we've got a one meter snowpack um, initialized at different states, and we're applying um, rainfall for three hours on that one meter snowpack. Um, on the left are the analytical solutions that we have, and we've um, extended the earlier work of Kolbeck 1976 um, to provide analytical solutions at every point in space and time. And then we're able to um, run our model um, for these different controlled experiments and um, check that we've um, implemented the equations correctly. Um, another um, thing that we're doing is that we've got an effort underway in process-based model evaluation. So um, what I'm showing in the figures here is work from Andrew Bennett. Um, so um, he's been looking at different models that have been configured over um, the Pacific Northwest and looking at um, what are the differences in their seasonal cycles of um, ET, snow water equivalent, runoff, etc. And then also digging into the models and um, looking at the transfer of information um, from, from states to fluxes and how the transfer of information is different across different models. That's just a small example of what, of, of what we're doing. Um, what our um, bigger thrust is um, that we're combining information from research catchments so that we can evaluate individual processes, um, operational networks, the snowtail network, um, larger networks of hydrometric stations um, to um, provide um, more comprehensive evaluation. And then also the continental domain where we have got information um, from satellite data. Um, we're interested in individual processes um, to decompose the model into its constituent hypotheses. And then we're also interested in the process couplings and the example of that is shown in Andrew Bennett's work. Um, we're also interested in model benchmarking and I know this has been a big focus of, of Gray Nearing and I've had the pleasure of working with Gray Nearing on a couple of his papers on that topic. Um, so benchmarks provide context for model simulations. And we can define low benchmarks, which define what we expect the model to be able to do. And then also high benchmarks, which define the predictability of the system. Um, what's the maximum information content that we can extract um, from the input output data. So what I'm showing in this figure here is, um, is some work from my postdoc, um, Walter Knurben, um, that he completed before joining me. And he's saying, well, um, what's the skill that we can get um, for the Klingupta efficiency, which is a common metric used to evaluate model performance, um, when we just use the seasonal cycle? Um, so the seasonal cycle is, is our prediction. And we're seeing that the Klingupta efficiency, you know, is super high um, in the snowmelt dominated basins in the interior west. And um, when we apply our process based models compared to that benchmark and um, the improvement is not as large as we might think otherwise. Really what we're trying to get to is um, um, models with high fidelity. Um, a lot of the community is um, traditionally focused on accuracy in order to uh, um, quantify the discrepancies between model simulations and observations. And what we're doing in our um, process-based evaluation work and our benchmarking work is to really um, try to evaluate the extent to which a model faithfully represents the dominant processes in the region where it's applied. I want to talk a little bit about um, our work to unify approaches for process-based hydrological modeling. Um, when we look at the terrestrial water cycle, um, we can draw figures like this. This is a figure from a 2015 paper. Um, and we look at figures like this and we see similar figures in other papers and textbooks. So based on this, we can see that most modelers share a common understanding of how the dominant fluxes of water and energy affect the time evolution of model states. Um, given that, given that we understand that we've got a common understanding of the terrestrial water cycle, the differences among our models really relate to how we discretize the model domain in space, um, the approaches that we use to parameterize the individual fluxes and the methods that we use to solve the governing equations. 
So the work that we did a few years ago in building the SUMA model um, was um, to define a single set of conservation equations for land biogeophysics, and um, that's the master modeling template, if you will, and have the capability to use different spatial discretizations, different flux parameterizations and model parameters and different time stepping schemes um, within that master template. So when we put this together, this is what my colleagues refer to affectionately as, um, as my horrendogram. Um, um, it seems complex, but it's really quite simple. Um, when, we put, when we pull it apart, the center of the model is the state equations. Um, so these are describing um, the temporal evolution of the thermodynamic and hydrological states in our system. So canopy temperature, snow temperature, soil temperature is the thermodynamic states, canopy storage, snow storage, soil water content, aquifer storage, etc. Um, those um, um, state equations are all solved using a global solver. So we've separated the physics from the numerics. And the uncertainty that we have is the flux parameterizations um, that define the fluxes at the, at the boundaries of the control volumes in our system that affect the temporal evolution of the model state variables. Um, so the benefits that we see here is to improve the understanding of differences among models, um, to improve understanding of model limitations, um, to improve how we characterize uncertainty. You know, we don't need to use an ad hoc collection of models. Um, we can um, deliberately construct an ensemble by flicking switches um, within this model um, and have a, have, have, have a large ensemble framework to characterize uncertainty. Um, we can begin to unite um, disparate modeling efforts um, um, through this unified framework. Um, we can, this is again, you know, moving to our paradigm of community hydrological modeling, where we, uh, it helps us simplify sharing of code and concepts across different model development groups. Um, enables us to look at um, issues of model complexity by excluding and including specific model processes. It simplifies the data assimilation efforts because our state variables are very obvious and exposed and um, it can reduce the development costs um, because we've got you know, modular structure that um, makes it more effective and efficient um, in order to push things forward. Um, what we've been doing here most recently has been to um, use the structure and in particular the separation of the physics from the numerics um, to be able to evaluate um, um, the use of third party solvers. So I work with, um, with Ray Spateri, um, we've got a unified set of land model equations and the solution of those equations is separate from the physical representation. So we've been implementing um, the, the sundial solver um, for our instantiations across North America um, to, to uh, um, improve the numerical robustness of our model implementations. Here's just a, you know, a quick example of that. This is um, from the location across North America with the largest error. Um, the original numerical solution in SUMA was backward oiler. Um, so we, we use that and then we also had backward oiler um, with um, 32 substeps. Um, so that's in um, um, the red and the blue um, respectively and, and the top plot. And then um, the bottom plot is comparing backward oiler um, with 32 substeps um, with, the, with the IDA solver that's used in sundials, um, suggesting that you know, with IDA, you know, we're getting um, the convergence that we expect to the correct um, solution. We're also interested in unifying spatial configuration. So in the SUMA framework, um, we've got a um, hierarchical spatial organization where we've got hydrological response units nested within grouped response units. Those HIUs and, and GOUs can be of any size and shape. So we can um, use that capability to mimic the spatial um, configuration you know, of multiple hydrological models. And the key challenge that we have, the key research challenge that we have is spatial scaling. So how can we develop flux parameterizations that represent the aggregate impact of subgrid scale heterogeneities? So um, how can we explicitly represent the spatial variability um, by having a high resolution spatial mesh, um, separate computations for process subsets, like separate computations for sunlit leaves, shaded leaves, separate computations for snow covered um, terrain, non snow covered terrain, etc. Um, representative hill slopes, implement hydrological similarity methods, etc. And then also, um, how can we implicitly represent um, spatial variability through a better representation of element average fluxes by upscaling parameter values, implementing new flux parameterizations, use of subgrid probability distributions, etc. 
when we're pulling this together, we can see that it's really a wicked interdisciplinary problem. What I'm showing in this figure here is the evolution of land models over the last few decades. And you know, this applies um, to um, multiple modeling communities where we can see in the early days, um, land models were really just providing a lower boundary condition to the atmosphere. They're providing you know, the surface energy fluxes um, that the atmosphere needed. Um, towards the end of last century, we got to the point um, where we had more mechanistic modeling of land surface processes, but under the paradigm that properties define processes. So we're interested in specifying the properties of the landscape and then using those to estimate um, short-term fluxes. You know, now where we are, um, the land is an integral component of the Earth system. We're, we're simulating processes across a myriad of time scales, and we're super interested in the interactions, you know, across time scales and the couplings and feedbacks. Um, so it's now um, more of a comprehensive um, representation of the terrestrial water cycle. Um, and energy cycle and biogeochemical cycles, you know, in these land models. Um, but what we see here is that we look at the processes that were included, and um, these same processes have been included in other modeling communities, but at different times. So in the hydrology community, of course, lateral flow was included in the early days. Um, but if we look at um, complex models, you know, state-of-the-art models across different um, modeling communities, all of these models now have got the same processes. And um, there's a huge and I think untapped opportunity for interdisciplinary research where we can begin to um, learn from each other um, and um, share our codes and concepts in order to accelerate the modeling um, that we're really trying to do. Wanted to um, talk a little bit about something fun that we were doing. Um, well, I found it fun um, because it was a bit of a challenge for us, um, was to how to parallelize hierarchical river networks. And so um, well, we've, got a, we've, we've got a river network like this. This is our Miser route routing model. Um, we have um, runoff um, from a hydrological response unit um, that's, um, that's routed um, to the HAU outlet. Um, it's um, routed through um, some river reaches, you know, to provide stream flow at every point in the river network. Um, the complicated thing about this is that the, that the downstream reaches, you know, clearly depend on the upstream reaches. So we have to be clever about how we spatially decompose the domain. So this is work that um, Naoki Mizukami has led at NCA, and I've been involved closely, closely with that over the past um, few years. I um, want to give an example of the decomposition of, of the Mississippi River Network. So this is showing the total reaches that are upstream you know, of, a, of, a, of a given point. And then um, the first thing that we do is that we decompose this domain into tributaries. So this is an example here where these four tributaries can be handled independently. Um, we can decompose it into eight domains, um, 16 domains, etc. And um, the, the nice thing that we're doing is by um, decomposing it into the major tributaries, we only need to communicate information from the um, tributaries um, to the main stems. So what we do is that all of the river reaches that aren't included in these tributaries, you know, here's, here's an example here, you know, all of these, um, small, all, all of these um, smaller reaches here in gray um, are handled by the mainstream processor and, you know, they don't need to be um, communicated. So um, our objectives here are to balance the load across the processes and um, minimize the communication costs. Um, we also um, have um, an additional spatial um, decomposition um, for each of those tributaries. Um, so that's handled with o OpenMP. Um, so we're using similar approaches um, to decompose each of these tributaries. So um, for each tributary, it's um, parallelized using OpenMP. Um, which is shared memory, and then the um, individual tributaries are um, 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 decomposed using MPI, which is um, which is distributed memory. So this is um, this is the way that it comes together here. So we've got um, some runoff um, that we're um, distributing um, to. Um, all of the tributaries. This is the example of um, the four domain decomposition. So all of these um, small reaches here um, in the gray are handled by the master node. And then we've got um, um, the different MPI tasks um, that are um, um, running independently. And then the decomposition you know, with each of these um, um, MPI tasks is, is handled um, using OpenMP. And then we only have to transfer information from the tributary outlets to the main stem, and then we process the main stem, and that's got a further decomposition you know, with OpenMP. Um, 
these are um, some of our scaling um, results. So we've got the results um, for the global domain and um, the um, this is like no open MP in the red and um, 16 threads open MP in, in the blue. Um, the um, dotted gray line, you know, is, is the perfect scaling. So for the global domain, there's tons of river basins. So, you know, we can um, decompose this um, quite effectively. When we run um, for a big river basin um, in the globe, um, this is an example for the Mississippi River Basin, um, the scaling um, becomes um, less effective. Um, because you know what we see is that the um, that the main stem is the bottleneck, um, but um, still, you know, we're, um, we're we're still able to you know if we don't um, push it to the limit, um, we're still able to get you know fairly fairly good scaling um, 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 with a, with just a few processes. We've been working to incorporate lakes and reservoirs. Um, so our um, lake and reservoir applications is um, applicable on both local and, um, and global domains. Here's just an example of the work that we've done um, for the Mackenzie River Basin, which is important to us in Canada, um, showing simulations of stream flow and lake level. And um, without you know, too much um, optimization, you know, these aren't really optimized yet. Um, we're seeing that we're able to simulate um, the lake level fluctuations for Great Bear Lake, um, which is this, um, this big lake here in the, in the northern part of the Mackenzie River Basin. And this is work that Shivan Gahari has been doing with Naoki Musakami. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is our work to understand the predictability of stream flow in order to guide science investments. So when we're talking about um, stream flow forecasting, what we do is that we run a model up to the start of the forecast period to estimate the basin initial conditions, how much snow is in the basin, um, and what are the soil moisture levels, et cetera. That provides us an estimate of the hydrological predictability. And then we run the model into the future um, with an ensemble of weather forecasts, um, for example, um, to produce forecasts of stream flow. And our um, capability to predict um, weather and climate um, provides um, our meteorological predictability. So the, que the question that we have is, how can we leverage both sources of predictability in order to improve streamflow forecasts? So the relative importance of hydrological predictability and meteorological predictability um, depends on your location, what basin you're working on. It depends on your forecast initialization time. Um, do you kick off the forecast at the beginning of October? Do you kick off the forecast at the beginning of April, et cetera? Um, it depends on the forecast lead time. Are we making the forecast over a two week period or a three month period? Um, and um, it depends on um, the variable that we're interested in forecasting. Are we interested in um, the inflow to the reservoirs over the summer or are we interested in extreme events, you know, things like that. So um, I wanna show now some work um, from Andy Wood um, who was looking at the elasticity of predictability. Um, so this is a really interesting concept um, where we're saying, okay, we know that there's two main sources of predictability, um, knowledge of initial conditions, knowledge of, um, knowledge of future climate. Um, if we use perfect model experiments and improve our knowledge of future climate or improve our knowledge of initial conditions, how much does this improve the forecast? So here our target was a three month um, streamflow forecast um, initialized on April 1st. So this is um, an example of reservoir inflow, for example. And, and this is showing the spatial plot of the spatial variability of the elasticity of predictability um, across the contiguous United States. Um, so what we're seeing here, as we'd, as we'd expect, is that when we're in the snowmelt dominated basins in the interior west, um, we're not getting much benefit from improved climate forecasts. What we do get benefit from is um, from um, improved knowledge of the basin initial conditions, improved knowledge of the snow. So this is helping us to guide um, some science investments where it's going to say, well, you know, if, if our target is to improve streamflow forecasts, this is, this is where we need to um, target our investment. So improve snow modeling, improve snow data assimilation, et cetera, in order to um, um, provide the end result that we need um, um, for society. 
Um, my postdoc, um, Louise Arnal, has been working with Andy Wood um, to pull together these forecasting workflows across North America. Uh, most of this is um, this pulled together now, you know, the different aspects, um, conus-wide inputs, hydrological modeling, forecast generation, verification, predictability, analysis, etc. She's got all of this together now. Um, here's some examples of ensemble streamflow forecasts um, that she's making for the Kootenay River at Fort Steele, um, which is just over the divide um, from us in Canberra. And um, she's um, beginning um, to provide um, the estimates of skill elasticity um, as to um, what's the relative importance of um, basin initial conditions and meteorological forecasts and climate outlooks on um, um, in the different basins across North America. So this example here for the Kootenay is replicating, you know, what we saw um, in the US um, where um, for a few months, these are forecasts initialized on, um, on May 1st. Um, um, the knowledge of the initial conditions is much more important than the knowledge of the future climate. So to, to sum up, um, I've got a, a few slides um, to provide a summary and an outlook. Um, I think it's often useful to um, contrast hydrological modeling with atmospheric modeling and really understand some of the challenges that we have. Um, our big challenge is that when we're modeling the terrestrial water cycle, it depends on the unknown details of the landscape. That's, that's very, very different um, from hydrological modeling. Um, what that means is that increases in horizontal resolution often don't lead to increases in hydrological model performance, especially at larger spatial scales. So in atmospheric models, we can increase the grid resolution, you know, and begin to resolve more and more processes, and, um, and um, that gets us somewhere, and we've seen that in the wharf simulations, etc. In hydrological models, um, we can't just drape a high-resolution grid over the landscape and expect that it magically provides um, better forecasts of streamflow. Um, we need um, to be creative in how we um, discretize the model domain in space. And um, when we're looking at that, and we're looking at um, what hydrologists have done, um, is that we've got a, a glut of models that differ in almost every aspect of their conceptualization and implementation. So when we think about this and contrast this with um, the people who have come before us, um, a lot of the most um, process-based models that we have in the community are based on the blueprint um, that was developed by Fries and Harlan in 1969. I don't want to focus so much on the blueprint, but what I do want to focus on is um, the questions that Fries and Harlan posed um, when they were developing their blueprint. So these are the questions here. And um, I'm arguing, and this is from my 27 um, paper in, in Hess, um, that these questions are very, very relevant um, for us today. Um, the first question relates to processes, uh, physically based mathematical descriptions of hydrological processes available, uh, interrelationships between the component phenomena well enough understood. Are the developments adaptable to a simulation of the entire hydrological cycle? I'd argue that we're still really struggling with that question, um, um, especially as it relates to spatial scaling. The second question related to parameters. Is it possible to measure or estimate accurately the controlling hydrological parameters? Are the amounts of input data um, prohibitive? And, you know, we see that, right? Um, is that um, the soils information that we have um, don't provide the information of the subsurface that we need in order to apply our models at hyper-resolution. Um, the third is, have the earlier computer limitations of storage capacity and speed of computation been overcome? Is the application of digital computers to this type of problem economically feasible? Um, third question on computing, and, and I'd argue that, um, yeah, we've had huge strides in our computing capabilities over the last 50 years, um, but we're necessarily um, pushing everything to the limit and um, we're, um, we're still worried about computing trade-offs as to how do we sacrifice um, um, our estimates of uncertainty if we want um, a higher spatial resolution, you know, questions like that. So what I, I'm arguing is that many of our modeling challenges map directly to Friesenhall in 1969. So many models do not adequately represent the dominant processes. So we see that the spatial gradients that drive flow occur at very, very small spatial scales and aren't resolved by even the finest terrain grid used in large domain hyper-resolution models. We're looking at a figure like this, a lot of the gradients that are important 
uh, at the sub hill slope scale and um, and those uh, those need to be resolved and the way to resolve that is not through a finer and finer resolution grid it's um, I think through methods like representative hill slopes where we can say okay let's have this hill slope of representative the larger domain and um, discretize it in the in the length scales that are important there's some examples of that being um, published in the modern literature um, parameters. Jim Kirchner years ago um, talked about models as mathematical marionettes that um, dance to match the calibration data even if their underlying premises are incorrect. Um, um, the challenge that we have in estimating the parameters in our models across large geographical domains are immense and um, need, uh, need a lot more attention. Um, what I mentioned before is that many of the vegetation and soils data sets that we use have got limited resolution um, and that's not the, um, the main factor. The main factor is that there's limited information content. Like e even if the soils data are implemented at higher spatial resolution, um, the information content that's, uh, that's in those data sets is still limited and still constraining what we're, what we're able to do. Um, the um, final challenge that we have is computing. And, you know, we've um, been blessed with rapid advances in um, computing capabilities, and that's enabling us to run for much larger domain sizes, have more detailed process representation, finer horizontal resolution, large ensembles, etc. You know, we can do all of those things. Um, but what we often find ourselves doing is um, pushing our models to the computational limit at the finest resolution possible, um, the most detailed process representation possible. Um, we're not explicitly evaluating trade-offs and process complexity and spatial complexity. And because we're doing that, we're sacrificing a lot of opportunities that we have for model analysis, model improvement and uncertainty characterization. So um, what I see is that the hydrology communities still, it's beginning to change, but historically has um, um, broken itself into camps um, where um, and they have a preference for physics or, or parsimony and we haven't done as much work as we should or could in order to understand the trade-offs across um, alternative modeling approaches. So I'll leave it there. Um, there's a a lot to do, a uh, lot to work on, and um, we're just a small part of the global community and I'd welcome any collaborations um, that we can begin to build up. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Martin. And it was a, such a fantastic webinar and letting us know what the University of Saskatchewan is doing. So I'll kind of open it up for everybody. If you have questions, you can either <clears throat> uh, unmute yourself or post it in the uh, chat window and I will, um, pose the questions to Martin. Anybody who would like to ask questions to Martin right now? I have one. Ah, I see Mukesh has raised his hand, so. Go ahead. Mukesh, you wanna go? Uh, please, please go ahead, Sagi. Okay, um, so I have a bunch of questions, but I, because there's other people are, uh, in the queue, so, um, I, I'm, I'm really interested in your, so first of all, thanks, thank you very much. This was very interesting um, and, uh, in, and impressive. Um, the first question I have is about channel geometry and whether you guys have, I'm sure you guys have looked into it and dealt with it in, in some way, but whether or not you think it's a, it's a critical component, how important is getting the channel geometry right for uh, continental and global scale hydrological modeling? It's, a, it's important. I'd step back from that a little bit. And what we're, what we're seeing, and this is um, something that we've known for a long time, is that the, the challenge isn't so much um, um, how to route, um, but it's more what to route. And, and I know that um, trivializes a, 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 lot of, a lot of work in, in hydraulics, but when we're comparing alternative methods um, for river routing across continental domains, um, this is a paper that we're about to submit, um, most of the difference comes in the, in the way that we represent hydrological processes on land, and um, less of the difference comes um, from the specific method that we use for river routing. Um, that's not saying that channel geometry is not important and, you know, we're, um, we're still using fairly simplistic estimates to estimate um, river width and mannings and, and etc. Um, but um, when we're looking at the terrestrial water cycle, um, there's a lot of other factors um, that are um, more of a constraint. 
Um, lots of lots of interesting work um, to do in that area. A um, lot of um, work on backwater effects, you know, that are really important in the in the flatter areas where the kinematic approximations don't hold, etc. And um, tons that can be done there. From but from a like ten thousand foot view, I'd say that um, how we simulate the hydrological processes on land um, are, are bigger sources of uncertainty than um, how we route the water through the rivers. Mukesh, go ahead. Hey, Martin. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I had a few quick uh, questions. I wanted to get your uh, view on these. So when you were presenting the probabilistic uh, estimates of uh, maybe precipitation temperature or other variables, um, I wonder if uh, you have or others have uh, are considering uh, other ancillary variables to get an idea of directionality and then how it impacts, let's say, precipitation. And I'm especially thinking about, let's say, southeastern US, where during the hurricanes, you know, directionality becomes very important and that can possibly improve uh, precipitation predictions. Yes, um, so in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, some of our collaborators at NCAR, um, particularly Andy Wood, has been looking at how we can use predictors um, from high resolution um, um, reanalysis products um, to improve the spatial estimates. In our initial work, um, all, all of our predictors were temporally constant, so we were using the topographic attributes at the station locations. Um, so um, they've been using and they've been they've been exploring things in those ways. Um, the work that we've been doing recently, the probabilistic estimates that I showed are from Gochang Tang, and there we're optimally combining um, the um, station estimates with the reanalysis information, you know, which provides more of the dynamics. Um, the other aspect of that is that how we generate the ensembles. So in all of the work that we've done so far, um, our ensembles are generated using um, the assumption of um, isotropic random fields. Um, so we, um, we're not generating anisotropic random fields, which are really important in some areas. Um, our um, key team member in here is um, Simon Papalexio. Um, and he's been um, really advancing um, our capabilities um, for stochastic modeling of hydroclimatic processes. And he's been doing some um, really interesting work, um, which will feed into the um, next generation of those products. So the short answer is like, yes, it's really important and that we're be beginning to look at it, but there's um, so much to be done. I think there needs to be a concerted community effort focused on some of these problems. Sure, thank you. Anybody else have any additional questions for Martin? Yeah, I do have one. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my question is more general, like should we trust global climate models when it comes to the region forecast? You know, if you see the background of the global climate models that is based on neighboring stock equations and there are a lot of inherent assumptions, but there is a lot of variability at sub scale or the regional scale. So basically my question is like how we should proceed with this would more focus on regional processes more rather than global like uh, global climate models the way they basically simulate the largest large scale uh, processes but when it comes to the regional scale processes it's still totally different so how to like improve the forecasting skills like how should we go for uh, this regional to global scale or global to regional scale so how these two basically couples to each other so that okay. we can improve the forecasting skills. Okay, so I'm not sure if I completely understand the question. So um, you're saying that um, the um, global Earth system models aren't um, able to capture the regional idiosyncrasies, and um, how do we how do we begin to bridge that gap? Yes, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, that's a really important question, and you know something that um, a lot of people have been beginning to think about. Um, what we're seeing is that the Earth System Modeling community, as I showed in that um, interdisciplinary slide, as to when different processes were added, you know, at different points in time, um, is um, beginning to get, you know, um, to the to the spatial scales that we care about in hydrology and uh, the differences that we have in process-based hydrological models and um, and the land models are getting fewer and fewer, and um, we're able to get there. Um, 
so in terms of like the general process representation, I think the um, improved representation of hydrological processes and earth system models is getting better and better and better. You know, there's some wonderful papers that you can look at recently by um, Sean Swenson and Nate Cheney who have really been able to um, push this forward. Um, what we're missing, I think, is um, um, the hydrological theory. So um, there's been the critique by Jeff McDonnell, you know, other people, you know, throughout the community for a long time about that. We're focusing on the idiosyncrasies of individual hill slopes and our capability to generalize is often lost. Um, so um, how can we develop um, and um, refine our unified um, understanding, our unified theory of hydrological processes in a way that um, 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 begins to inform the development of um, models that are applied across continental domains and, and global domains. And um, those, are, those are the theoretical developments that I think are missing. Often our conversation among modelers is um, what's the difference among algorithms and um, we're missing the conversation as to, well, um, what's, um, what's the relationship between these algorithms and our process understanding? There's some of that, that, that I think that, um, that link um, between um, theory and numerical implementation needs to be much stronger as we're beginning to move forward. Okay, thank you. Okay, everyone, we probably have time enough for one more question. Is there anybody else out there that, that would like to uh, ask him a question? Maybe I can. Um, Martin, uh, I just want to follow up in your last comment. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, in the community, it has been recognized that the equations that have been derived at uh, maybe a continuum scale uh, they are not applicable at larger scales. But mm -hmm. Would you say that it's uh, largely because of uh, the data is sparsity or we don't know the data? If we knew the data, then the water flow is essentially fluid mechanics and one should be able to resolve it. Are you, are you, are you talking specifically about the storage and transmission of water in the soils or more broadly? Uh, uh, more broadly, but uh, definitely subsurface uh, properties are one which we don't know much about. Right. Um, yeah, I think data limitations is a big part of it. Um, our, um, and that goes hand in hand with our theoretical understanding, right? And um, we're beginning to um, see much more explicit representations of things like macropore flow and these larger earth system models, you know, that have been in the Vedo zone community for a long time. So that um, theoretical understanding is there. Um, but I'm not sure that data by itself, you know, will solve all of our problems. And the challenge, of course, Makesh, as you know very well, is that um, we're not just dealing with individual processes like Vedasa and hydrology, we're um, dealing with a, a myriad of processes that interact across a range of different space and time scales. And each of those processes has got its own scaling behavior and own complex um, coupling behavior. So being able to um, pull all of that together, you know, is, is quite challenging. Again, Martin, thank you very much on, on behalf of the Alabama Water Institute. I appreciate everybody that participated in today's webinar and again, extend a very large thank you again to Martin for his time today to present these facts. Um, again, everybody, I hope that everybody has such a fantastic day and we look forward to the next webinar that we'll have in the near future. Thank you, everyone. Okay, perfect. Thanks yeah. for having me. Thank you, Martin. Yep. Okay, bye-bye.